Welcome to Pocket Dilemmas, our podcast where we discuss political and economic questions which are facing the world today. I'm Jonathan Charles. I'm joined by my colleague Kerry Law. Today we're in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, for our annual meeting, the EBRD annual meeting, and we're recording this episode in front of a live audience in the old parliament building. The question is, what's next? Change, disruption, innovation, transformation, the trends already shaping our present and future. Can we prepare, adapt, and future-proof? Well, that's our dilemma today. Mega trends, ready or not, here they come. What are pocket dilemmas? Are algorithms biased? Will robots take away your job? Do you trust cryptocurrencies? How do we bridge the pay gap? What is the future of poverty? This is dilemmas at ebrd.com. So, megatrends. Today we'll try to understand what they are, how we can prepare for them. We've got Leo Johnson, our fellow podcast host of the BBC Radio 4 programme, Future Proofing. He tried to help us define the scope of the issues which we'll be grappling with today. Hello, Sarajevo. I'm Leo Johnson. I present the BBC Radio 4 show, Future Proofing, about what's coming down the track. And one of the big questions I try to grapple with is, what are megatrends going to do to business and society? What are the big megatrends? We all know what they are. There's climate change, urbanization, the, the demographic shifts, the geopolitical shifts, power potentially shifting to the east. But the question for me is, what's the collision of all these megatrends with technology? What's the big question? How do you future-proof yourself and your business against the megatrends? How do you look at the stack of technologies that you've got available and help identify the cognitive surplus of the people inside and outside your organization that you can unlock and the market opportunities that that combined intelligence can help to solve problems for. So these are truly puzzling questions. How do we prepare for these global forces? How do we unlock human and business potential to future-proof against these forces? The slogan of the 2018 Ernst & Young Megatrend Report says today's disruption requires both a broader perspective and a narrower focus. Kerry, you've been producing EBRD's Megatrend series within the bank. What's your take on them? Where does this name come from? Yeah, so the Megatrend series was really kind of the brainchild of some of the strategic thinkers in the bank, and the purpose was really to dive deep into one of these big megatrends each year to figure out what the implications were for our countries of operation, but also how we should even think about this topic. Um, so the term megatrends, it's not actually a new term. It was coined by this gentleman by the name of John Nesbitt, who was an American author in the early 1980s. I thought it was something that came from Silicon Valley, but it's actually been around for a while. It's even in the dictionary. Um, so John has this great, great quote, which I love. He says that trends, like horses, are easier to ride in the direction that they're going. Um, so a little cheesy, but I guess we need to grab our cowboy hats and uh, saddle up. Um, so just to touch on one of these big trends, to put it in our, in our mind and to give, to give us some sort of scale and frame. So dig digitalization is something we focused on in our Make a Trend series last year, kind of under the auspice of the future of work. Um, it affects our lives in ways that we maybe think about a lot and ways that we maybe not realize. So Thomas Friedman, um, he's an author, he wrote this book called Thank You for Being Late, which I wish I was thanked for being late, um, which says that over 51% of our lives are spent in cyberspace. So we learn on cyberspace, we make transactions in cyber, cyberspace, we work in cyberspace, we date on cyberspace. You know, there's pretty much nothing that we don't do that and won't do um, that can't be done on cyberspace. So these megatrends can really be transformational. Yeah, and if you think about transformational ones, Kerry, of course, you've got climate change, for example, threatening the existence of our planet. You've got demographic changes, those big explosions. The UN predicts that Africa, Nigeria in particular, will be at the forefront of huge global population rise over the next century, whereas countries like Belarus, Bulgaria, Cuba, Romania, Russia, Ukraine, they're among the countries where populations are expected to drop by more than 15%, staggering figure, by 2050. Across the EBRD countries of operations, you've got uh, automation of the workforce is presenting opportunities, but also risks for the regions which have high youth unemployment, like Jordan or Albania. 
All of this transformation, as Leo said, isn't just happening one by one. It's a big collision of very fast-paced events. They're, they're coming together, and they're transforming our planet uh, and us as well. You know, we shouldn't forget the human element in all this. These are the megatrends. Well, Kerry, we've got a great lineup of guests who will help us figure out the scope of the challenge. Uh, Alexia Latortu is the EBRD Managing Director for Corporate Strategy. Sergey Guriev is the EBRD Chief Economist. Neil Buckley from the Financial Times is the Chief Leader Writer. And Tim Judah is the Economist Correspondent for the Western Balkans, this region that we're in before the live audience today. Also a fellow at IWM, the Institute for Human Science. And we're going to be talking to them and getting their views on these megatrends. So. Absolutely. So let's start. So I have the first question for all of our guests. What is your quick five-second take on megatrends, and what's the most pressing megatrend? I'll start with Alexia. Thanks so much, Carrie. So three points in terms of my take on megatrends. Number one, simple, but they really are shaping our world. And when I say I, our world, I mean our economies, our businesses, but very importantly, our societies, individuals, and how individuals interact and relate to each other. Second point is that they are here. We're not talking about future proofing or what's coming in the future. These forces are shaping our world today. The future is here, not always visible. We don't always understand the implications of how they're shaping us, but it's here today. And my third point is something that Jonathan already alluded to, which is we can get very excited about new things. We can get excited about new technologies. But the implications of these mega trends, in my mind, need to always be considered with people at the center. Mm. What is the impact? What are the opportunities? What are the risks for human beings? So, Gregoriev, what's your top line? I would just list the mega trends, which I think are the most important and pressing. You mentioned some of them. I think the biggest challenge is uh, what is related to future of work, uh, the hauling out of middle-skilled uh, jobs in many countries driven by technological progress and globalization. The second challenge is what you've already mentioned, demographics, aging, and uh, youth bulge in some countries. Uh, so these forces are, again, they're forces which uh, cannot be easily stopped. And the implication of both but something which, that should be discussed on its own is migration. The cost of geographical reallocation of people is going down. Returns to migration are very high, and that, of course, is going to result in major disturbances. And the third uh, trend is climate change. This is something that uh, also will transform everything, whether mitigated or not. This is also a mega trend that needs to be taken into account. Neil Buckley. Well, you asked for five seconds. I'm trying to give you five seconds. My Unlike the other guests. The, the most important mega trend, climate change, uh, for me, it's the only one, uh, it's, it's both the most consequential one and the only one that's truly existential. Uh, it's something I was learning about in school 35 years ago about how more action was needed to tackle this problem. My kids are learning the same thing today and my kids' generation are threatening to take over and run the show if we don't do something about it. So that's the most pressing one. Great. Tim? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm going to concentrate on, on this region, the Western Balkans, or the wider Balkans. Um, and basically, people here tend to obsess, or correctly, uh, up to a point about uh, corruption, ethnic problems, and uh, discussions and arguments about uh, um, moving borders, even. But actually, the, the, the real megatrend is uh, what's already been mentioned. It's a demographics and migration. That means people moving out of the region and these societies um, aging uh, very fast. And uh, uh, effectively, what we're seeing is uh, the, the, a region sharing some of the, um, uh, some of the indicators of, of rich European countries, like um, older populations and very far, low uh, fertility, but at the same time having to cope with uh, indicators of uh, poorer countries like high emigration. Uh, in the past, uh, people from this region have, have always emigrated, but they always had um, high birth rates to, to compensate, and that's no longer the case. Um, and uh, solving this is the, is the great dilemma of the next uh, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. 
All right, that's the flavour of what's to come in the next few minutes. Our today's dilemma, just to remind you, is mega trends, ready or not, here they come. To what extent can we prepare for the global shifts reshaping our world? Let me remind you, you're listening to Pocket Dilemmas, our podcast where we discuss political and economic questions facing the world today. You can download, subscribe and rate us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify or anywhere you can get your podcast from. So over the last few days, we've been polling the Twittersphere to figure out what you and what your <coughs> thoughts are on what the most pressing megatrend is. Do you agree with our guests? Do you have some of your own ideas? Um, and the results, I guess, weren't that surprising, but it was, uh, it was pretty tilted one way, and you'll find out in a second. Um, so from polling the Twittersphere, we found out that 5% of you thought that digitalization was the most pressing megatrend, followed by urbanization at, fifth, at, at 5% as well. And then 15% of you thought that global power shifts was the most pressing megatrends, and 75% said that climate change is what they were most worried about. So yes, pretty that's strong. Through fairly strongly, yeah. isn't that? <coughs> Excuse strong. me, that's coming through very strongly, that climate change thought. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Alexia, um, the world's population just passed the 7 billion person mark, which is astounding. And it continues to grow by 75 million people a year. So to put that into perspective, that's, the, that's more than the population of the UK that's being added to the global population each year. And as you can imagine, as these you know, people start to enter um, the countries, enter the workforce, just enter the world, really, there are significant challenges that arise uh, in areas of resource management, food supply, health care, urban infrastructure, disaster mitigation, just to name a few. So no pressure. Um, your entire career, you've kind of focused on how to approach risks. Um, so what should we do about this? How should we think about approaching some of these risks and some of these megatrends? Come up with a policy immediately. <laughs> Im immediately. No, and of course, this growth is happening quite unequally around the world, right? So I think this is linked to what you were saying. So um, risks, absolutely. I mean, I think the issue of having to be much more productive about the resources that we have, and many of our resources are finite. Um, and that's a real challenge. So here is an, er an area where technology can help, whether it's in agricultural productivity, to be able to yield more crops um, from the same amount, the same hectare of land, can create new opportunities in terms of feeding um, the, 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 the new uh, uh, population growth. But also, I think there's a real potential that digital, again, is helping with, um, as, well, as well as some of the power shifts, which is the consumer as advocate, and almost the consumer as policymaker. Because as consumers become more aware of these risks, um, they have a role in changing behaviors to make sure that the way we human beings are on this earth is more sustainable, including things like changing our eating habits, uh, eating less meat, for example. Um, and I think those, those, those behavior changes, frankly, the nudges, can come from citizens as advocates perhaps more powerfully than policymakers uh, top down. I also think the concept of shared economy, the idea that not every single household needs to have a car, um, but we in a neighborhood, in a community, can actually have sharing services uh, to be able to re uh, reduce uh, uh, the tax on Mother Earth while still being able to have the services that we need. And finally, I think the decentralization of services, um, being able to have more basic services come into your home, come to where you are, uh, the cell phone being able to be a provider of important health messages so we don't all have to go and crowd uh, public infrastructure hospitals is another example. Do you think generational trends trends, you know, generational change is going to help? Is it the friend against megatrends? And I, I think particularly what you were saying about sharing resources, because that's very much uh, something in line that younger generations do. They do it automatically in a way that older generations don't. You know, I know there's a lot of negative talk about the millennials, but I'm really positive <laughs> about the future. I'm positive about the youth. I think they should take over to help us with climate change, frankly. Um, and I think they, their awareness of the power of the individual is unsurpassed. And I think we can tap into that. None of these megatrends, of course, are happening in isolation, are they? As, as we suggested earlier, they're all coming at the same time. You know, does that raise a question of bandwidth in, in terms of ability to deal with all these megatrends? Because in the end, authorities, governments, civil services, whoever is engaged in so they only have so much bandwidth. So I think the bandwidth mm -hmm. issue is, is important and uh, the risk of being paralyzed by the complexity of it all is there. Um, however, I actually think the collision uh, provides opportunities because it makes some of these forces more concrete. 
So if you look at climate change as a megatrend, and if you look at new technologies as a megatrend, the intersection, the collision of those two, is where the opportunities perhaps might lie in terms of innovations uh, with regards to renewable energy, for example. So actually, I think that it's when they come together that you see the opportunities. If I look at youth, we've talked about demographics, um, and the fact that we have to create so many jobs um, and the difficulty of countries in doing so. Well, the fact that today a young entrepreneur can start a new business in one day in many, many countries, including some of the EBRD countries, with very little capital or by crowdsourcing capital, leveraging again some of the trends that we see, I think actually start to help us visualize the opportunities and the reality of what's happening as opposed to something big far out there. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, I know you mentioned demographics. Let's stick with that, Alexia, because women, certainly in this region, for example, here we are in the Western Balkans, women and, and the older generation certainly hold the key to the future of the region, according to research by PwC. Uh, demographics will be critical. This is one of the key challenges for the Western Balkans region. Uh, demographics and urbanization probably vie as being the key challenges. We've been speaking to two mayors, uh, Petra Shilagov from Skopje and uh, Erion Veliaj from Tirana, the Albanian capital, to learn just how do they address these challenges and particularly the challenges of urbanization. What I have to do is the planning uh, how the city is going to run the next 30 years. Uh, therefore, we are uh, developing, uh, we have a southern part of the city uh, which is uh, developed and northern part which is undeveloped and the pressure for living is of course on the southern part. At the end, if we allow this to happen, we will have two sides of the river we have, uh, which uh, have uh, unquality uh, space or public spaces uh, for living. Therefore, we are investing a lot uh, in this period and our plan is uh, to invest in good infrastructure in the northern part in order to uh, make better conditions uh, there for living and my expectation is after that that the market will do the rest of the thing. Statistically, the city of Tirana grows by about 25 to 27,000 people a year, many of them young people. So nine out of 10 students who study in our 20-some universities will never go back to where uh, they came from. They see Tirana as a place of opportunity, a place where there's a concentration of talent, a place where the economy grows, and a place where you can be um, Catholic or Muslim, you can be straight or gay, you can be a hippie or a conservative, and I think that's an opportunity. It is a challenge in terms of urban planning. We have to keep housing affordable and we need to keep the city expanding with quality, not sprawling, but maybe densifying in high quality. But I think in the end, it's an opportunity. Yeah, I love those clips. And nine out of 10 people will not go back to where they came from. I think that's, I think that's quite shocking. So Sergey, um, you chuckle over there, and I'm going to ask you the next question. So the challenge of urbanization is clearly a pressing one. It's one that you focus on and your team focuses on. So what, what are the key ways for dealing with future-proofing for kind of this big mega trend? Thank you, Kerry. Indeed, urbanization is coming up whether you like it or not, because people are more productive when they live together, when they live in agglomerations, and that's why people move to big cities, and this is the future in all countries. And indeed, uh, then the challenge is how to plan urban spaces, how to develop urban spaces in the way to make people more productive and to provide them with better quality of life. And that, of course, requires long-term planning, as Petra just said. Uh, the challenge is how to plan that with a, not at a top-down approach, but an inclusive approach, bringing in citizens themselves thinking about those issues, and also opening up data, which now exists increasingly in uh, the cities. Data on uh, not just public sector, but data on migration of people within the city, data on transportation, data on use of energy. We actually work uh, with some municipalities in our countries trying to use uh, mobile data, trying to help the cities to plan where to invest, which uh, uh, types of municipal infrastructure to support, maintain, and develop. Uh, but the key is actually to engage a transparent and inclusive conversation with the citizens, with the private sector, because as uh, Petri rightly said, eventually, uh, 
the government's job, the mayor's job, is only to create the conditions for citizens and the private sector to take care of that. We should not pretend that we know how to invest for the next 30 years. We know that people around there are much smarter than just one mayor. And this is happening now, and the new technology helps to engage uh, citizens in a uh, decentralized approach to participate in developing urban strategy. So how, but how do you actually plan for the right mix of demographics in these areas and so that the cities and the regions don't overdevelop or underdevelop? And then how does climate change and the impact on climate sustainability play into the planning? Well, this is, this is of course, a top priority for every city because, uh, as I mentioned, we, we find that uh, people in cities are more economically provide, uh, pr productive, but the challenge is to make sure that pollution and congestion do not destroy quality of life. And uh, this, is, uh, this is something which is reasonably straightforward, and this is something that we do in, in, in our work in the BRD. We have these green city action plans. Uh, where we talk to the cities and ask them to develop a long-term strategy in a, as I mentioned, in an inclusive way, and in different cities that would be different priorities. I would not suggest that I can give you one answer that fits all. This is very important. In some cities we are talking more about water, in some cities we talk about renewable energy, in some cities we talk about wastewater uh, or water ma uh, waste management as a, as a priority. So the answer will always be city specific. And I think we should not think that we sitting even here in this great building know all the answers. The answers are necessarily city specific. And uh, I think what is key, and we've talked about that, is also to engage younger people who now increasingly realize that older generations have so far failed to address the challenges you mentioned, including the climate change challenges. Sergey, thank you very much. Let me remind you, you're listening to Pocket Dilemmas. We're recording this before a live audience in the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo. Uh, it is our podcast where we discuss political and economic questions facing the world today. You can download, subscribe, and rate us on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, or anywhere else that you get your podcast from. We would love you to do that. Tim Judah, you're the economist correspondent for the Balkans. In a recently published study on brain drain, a study by Gallup, countries of the Western Balkans ranked the worst in Europe. I mean, it's a pretty bad situation, isn't it? Uh, it is a very dramatic situation. The population of all Balkan countries and basically all Central and Eastern European countries as well um, has been dropping. Uh, you mentioned uh, 2050. Um, I've got some statistics here. Uh, by 2050, the population's uh, of, uh, for example, of Albania will have dropped 20% compared to uh, 1989, Romania more than 30%, Bulgaria 38 points, or 39%, and Moldova uh, a quarter. So these are uh, pretty dramatic uh, statistics. Um, now, is it happening? It's happening everywhere, but it's not necessarily happening um, equally. For example, uh, Tirana, we just saw Arion Veliai, the mayor there. Um, uh, that's a, a city which is, is increasing in population, uh, partly because uh, perhaps Mr. Veliai is making an attractive uh, place to live. But uh, uh, take Cluj in Transylvania um, 25 years ago, a kind of rather a, a his, well, historic city, but a sort of a grim, uh, classic, uh, communist uh, city dominated by uh, heavy industry. Now, the mayor of uh, Cluj um, has developed uh, plans in collaboration with the uh, universities uh, there, it's a major university centre, uh, to replace, as he says, uh, brawn power with brain power. And it's working. It's really amazing. The mayor is now uh, planning uh, um, homes for 200,000 new people to come to Cluj. Uh, and he's got 20,000 software engineers uh, clustered there. So it is possible to reverse this. Uh, it is possible uh, to, to do things. But if you're asking me what's the solution for the, the whole region, well, I have to say, in general terms, it's not rocket science. It's basically paying people better, uh, giving them good schools, uh, good health care, uh, courts that work, and, uh, and, and just making life just generally better. And that's the job of, uh, of government. But it's, it's hard, but it's got to be done. Otherwise, uh, these, these countries will, this whole region will be old before it's rich. So Tim, you mentioned universities. Um, so we hear a lot about lifelong learning, reskilling, upskilling as ways to address this matching problem. So matching people with skills and jobs. 
would policies around you know encouraging um, this kind of lifelong learning or reskilling and upskilling would this help with brain drain and can technology help with with this? Uh, I'm not so sure uh, about that. I mean, I haven't done any particular research about that. But um, here in Sarajevo, I was talking um, uh, last night with the Albanian uh, Minister of, uh, uh, of Finance. And she said that actually, in the last couple of years, they have modernized and upgraded their vocational schools. And actually, what's happening, she said, for the first time, we're seeing people and students and parents as well thinking, well, maybe university isn't the be all and end all. Maybe it's better to go to a vocational school. And she says 85%, if I'm, I'm, I mean, I may sound corrected, but it's about 85% of people who uh, graduate from their vocational schools get jobs uh, uh, very quickly within the first year. They're all employed. Uh, the risk is, of course, that those people you know, have a good skill which they can then go abroad and, and, and use. But she says that in Albania, um, that's not happening so far. The large numbers are, of those people are actually uh, staying at home because, of course, the, the, you may get paid less if you stay at home in Albania or Romania or, or, or here in Bosnia, but uh, your, you, your, your money uh, income is certainly going to uh, stretch further. And I think that's part of the problem. We're seeing some return, some circular uh, movement because people think, well, I might go to Germany and get paid X thousand, uh, X thousand uh, uh, euros and that's 10 times what I get paid here, but on the other hand, you may get 10 times less for your money once you pay for your, for your rent, food, transport, etc. Exactly. Okay, so Neil, I'm going to bring you into the conversation, Neil with the FT. So there's a view that businesses are becoming or could become more powerful than the state or than countries. You as a journalist, you've worked in some of these areas, you focus on global politics and business. Are you seeing this as kind of a reality on the ground? Yes, I, I'm one of the, uh, the series title here is Pocket Dilemmas, uh, and I think there is a major dilemma uh, facing business, uh, which is that we're seeing um, that the business has been both uh, a driver of and a beneficiary of uh, processes like globalization, uh, development of free trade, um, against which we are now seeing a political and popular backlash. Um, so this puts businesses in a bind because they want to preserve the system. They find themselves uh, increasingly powerful um, but wanting to defend the globalized system um, against uh, the erosion of that system. Um, but at the same time, they are seen as being uh, causes of many problems like social inequality, like deindustrialization, shifting of jobs, uh, from richer countries to uh, poorer countries. So I think business uh, is, is finding itself having to shape up, to face up to these issues, um, and they are they're starting to realize it. You, we're starting to hear it in private from, from executives that they recognize that they have to make changes. You're hearing it publicly from people like Jamie Dimon of, of JP Morgan, Ray Dalio of Bridgewater Capital, both recently spoke out about this. Um, uh, so th there, is a, there is a recognition. I think there is a pressure also for a kind of rethink of the capitalist model, a shift to a more inclusive kind of capitalism uh, with less focus on profits for shareholders uh, and more consideration given to uh, employees communities and broader stakeholders. You're seeing that, that kind of issue now being picked up in US politics by uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, for example. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Neil. So does that lead you to think that we might be moving to, certainly from business, more of what might be called a social capital approach, where they are taking this broader view? And what does that mean for politics? Because obviously megatrends aren't just about the impact on business. Um, You've mentioned there the, the populist backlash. If we see business rethinking the approach, when do politicians start doing that, or do you think they've started? Uh, two good questions. On, on, on the business front, I think there is, uh, you know, companies have internalized for a long time the idea of corporate social responsibility, mm. but they're having to go beyond that now, I think, and, and recognize that there is a pressure for them to, to, to think and operate in a different way, to focus less on profit uh, and more on purpose, 
there's a lot more pressure on companies to show now that they are doing something useful and producing... So it's going beyond lip service or something rather more exactly. tangible. Which producing are... something necessary rather than just making money for the purposes of making money. In terms of, of politics, uh, actually, although at the, the start I said, I think the number one uh, uh, mega trend, uh, most pressing issue is climate change. To my mind, it's, it's run a, a very close second by something else which, which we feel all the time when we're writing FT leaders, which is uh, a, an erosion of the global order that we've seen in place really since, since the Second World War, um, uh, of multilateral institutions, of the kind of rules, that were, rules of the game that the leading democracies tried to put in place after the Second World War. Lots of factors uh, coming into that, it's, it's the rise of China, the rise of the, the global south economically, um, it's certain countries and political leaders dis, uh, in the democracies deciding that those organisations and structures don't necessarily work in their favour. So you see that with uh, Donald Trump and his attitude to the WTO or NATO, you see it in Brexit, although some of you may have noticed that Brexit hasn't happened yet, hmm. um, but we'll wait and see. Um, uh, you know, the fact that China is rising, becoming so economically powerful when it is, remains a one-party system, those are all challenging the models and assumptions that we've, we've had in place for, for the last few decades. And I think this is a big concern at a time when we need global cooperation to confront these enormous challenges that we're discussing today. Our uh, today's dilemma, the thing we're discussing today, as Neil points out, is megatrends. Ready or not, here they come. Climate change, technology, urbanisation, resource scarcity, global power shifts, and how do we prepare for these global shifts? Uh, you'll have a chance, by the way. We are before a live audience today in Sarajevo. You will have a chance to ask your questions in a, in a very short moment. So please prepare them. We would love to hear from our audience. Uh, you can put up your hands and ask your questions, and we would like to hear from you. So globalization has produced some really important power shifts, as mentioned by most of our panelists today. Um, so BlackRock actually expects that India is going to rival the US by 2050 or even sooner. So today we have a really special guest with us. We have Himant Kanoria, who's the chairman and managing director of SREI Group from India. It's one of India's leading infrastructure finan financing institutions. Thank you so much for being here today. So how do you see the effect of megatrends and power shifts from an Indian perspective? What's the view from the opposite side? And how do you view the cooperation with Europe going forward? Well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here. You know, as we have seen that uh, there has been a power shift to a very large extent towards China and India. India, we have already reached about $2.5 trillion as uh, the GDP. And in the next six years, the target is to be at $5 trillion. And also, because there is a huge shift which has happened in India on digitization, it was demonetization, which was introduced in the country in such a massive way. And we have a 1.3 billion population. And all, the, uh, all the, uh, the villagers even had to open accounts in the banks. So it has been a huge digitization process. And that's the reason this year, we are having 900 million people going for elections and voting. So this is, for, by any standards, it is the largest democracy voting happening at 900 million. All the 900 million voting will get completed in May. And within two days, the results will be announced. So this is all a result of digitization. So I think that there is a huge shift in the, where the economic power is concerned, where the power which has gone to the people at large in India, we can witness that because almost about 75% of our population is below the age of 35. So that is where this mega trend has happened. So, and because of that, BCG had just come out with a report about three weeks back saying that there will be a um, demand of about $200 billion coming only from the rural areas next year in India. So that's where I think that there is a huge shift and India has to be at the center point now. Even on the climate change side, in the last five years about 20,000 megawatt of renewable energy plants have been installed in India and the target is about 100 gigawatt 
in another 10 years. So that is where we are going on the climate change. So India is also conscious about the climate change. Very interesting. I mean, Alexei, you just listened to that. Neil, you just listened to that. I wonder what you just very quickly both think about what that tells you about the mega trend shift. Because clearly you've got India changing quite fast. Uh, India and China clearly between the two global mammoths in terms of population. Uh, and that, you know, population is also key to, to the mega trends. I mean, two, maybe two reactions, because we're short on time. The first one is, wow, and look at this incredible opportunity. Um, in the video that we saw with Leo Johnson, he talked about the megatrends helping to unlock opportunities. And the example you described and what was done in India with the universal ID and then digitization really is unlocking the potential of the rural poor is one of the examples that you gave. And I think that's powerful. And I think one of the lessons is we can learn from all kinds of places and knowledge is 360. And the concept, the very old fashioned concept of transfer of knowledge from one part of the world to the other is upside down now. And that's powerful and, up and, and fascinating. But I think we have to also be very honest here. We haven't talked a lot about the transitions as these megatrends unfold themselves. And the transition when there's change, including change in power dynamics, including change of learning coming from perhaps different parts of the world than we're used to, that makes people uncomfortable. We have to be really honest about that. And so how do we address uh, the lack of comfort, the fact that there are new actors in the room, new players in the room, uh, players that have more university graduates than sort of the countries of the past in the room. How do we address that? Because it creates social challenges, it, cre it creates political backlash, if not addressed up front in a straightforward manner. Neil. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you know, you highlighted the, the, the growth of the dynamism of, of India and, and the, its economy and its technology. And to, to go back to the point I was making before on, on the global system, this isn't about, you know, I'm not arguing that we have to keep the current global system unchanged. Of course, countries like China, India, need to be brought into that system to have a bigger role, a bigger say, commensurate with their size and importance and dynamism. But the problem is we're in, a, we're in a transition phase at the moment where the old system is breaking down, the new system hasn't come into being yet. In fact, we're not actually engaging very well in creating this new system. And that shift, I think, creates a lot of, uh, a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of dangers right now, um, uh, because we're, we're, in the, we're in that in-between phase, and we're, we're not, it's by no means clear that we are going to reach a satisfactory uh, destination. It's very difficult for always, isn't it, for old systems to give up what might be called acquired rights, you know, and I think that's, that's the transition question. Uh, okay, let's open the floor now to questions uh, from our audience. Uh, please put up your hands. We'll come around with microphones and we start with the gentleman over there in the jacket. So someone is coming right to you. Okay, so basically I'm, gonna, I'm Ardian Hoja. I'm a, an entrepreneur from Kosovo. I'm also the chairman of the Technology and Innovations Committee with the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'm going to relate to the discussion, and basically, uh, I would say that the, the biggest mega trend now is the fast change. So fast change in everything, climate change, technology, everything. And uh, you also mentioned that uh, it's the older generations that have failed us. Uh, and uh, also, there was the message yesterday from the prime ministers that uh, uh, the EU should embrace uh, Western Balkans. So I think uh, all of this uh, requires a paradigm shift of the EU, the old continent. Okay, let me just get two quick responses then. Uh, first of all, on this question, of one problem is the fast pace of change. Sergei, young Sergei Guriev, uh, <laughs> what do you think about it? Well, uh, I, think, uh, I think the response to uh, new challenges is always uh, about learning how to handle those challenges, and this is uh, where the new generation, but also the old generation, needs to upskill, reskill, and so on. This is something that uh, Kerry was talking about. The, the problem is that no longer it is easy to uh, get uh, one set of skills for all your life and be very happy about that. The speed of change is so fast, you need to uh, create a state of mind and technology to reskill yourself, retool yourself several times during your career. And this is where a new technology can help. 
But this is where old system, unfortunately, is not very well prepared. I used to run a university, and I know how university system is unfortunately, or fortunately, too conservative. And I think this is where the hope is that there will be new players or partnerships between old and new players using and leveraging new technology, providing skills like uh, Hemant was talking about to uh, younger generations, and uh, this is this is where the hope is, and this is this is the only way to handle this fast uh, pace of change, to uh, to reform the way we adapt, and it's all 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 about learning and practicing new skills. But the problem is we still don't know how to deliver those new skills. There are innovations here and there, but good news is technology is here, and there is also an opportunity for private sector. So the new uh, new entrants will deliver. Tim Judah, uh, there are requests there for a, the Western Balkans is waking, waiting for a paradigm shift from the EU. Is that right? Uh, well, well, yes, but I think it's not just the Western Balkans, it's a lot of people in Europe are waiting for a, a paradigm uh, shift. I think there's frustration on, uh, on both sides. Uh, I mean, I have to say that one of the kind of ironies, uh, uh, or one of the okay, pocket dilemma, if you, if you like, is that actually uh, in the short term, EU short or medium term anyway, EU membership uh, can exacerbate some of the problems yeah. of, uh, uh, of, of Balkan countries uh, when it comes to um, ease of uh, migration, especially well, that's what we saw in Bulgaria, that's what we saw in, in Romania, and now that legal migration uh, for work, and especially this year, has become uh, easier, we're seeing uh, large queues in front of the consulates from uh, Banja Luka here in Bosnia, Herzegovina, to, um, to Pr Pristina. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, you know, I think be careful what, what you wish for. I mean, it would be great if uh, the, the rest of Europe was uh, more dynamic and more welcoming and that Kosovars could get visas to travel or did no longer needed visas to travel. Sorry, I'm getting it go wrong there. Uh, but it would be great if, uh, if um, societies and governments, especially in the Western Balkans, uh, um, could also be sort of uh, more dynamic and, 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 and thinking about the future and perhaps thinking uh, less about uh, 20th century problems, uh, ethnic problems and, and, and borders and, and more about uh, developing uh, IT skills uh, uh, for, uh, for, for, for their populations and, uh, and sellable, uh, sellable skills for younger people. Okay, I saw another hand amidst our packed audience. Uh, gentleman straight ahead of me, and there's a microphone heading your way. Peter Schoeding, I'm a research journalist for the ENA, European News Agency. Uh, one mega trend that I seem not to have heard uh, explicitly is uh, the impact of religion. However, I would like to focus a bit more on what is our belly button here in Europe, uh, is actually Europe itself. Uh, we are only going to be representing something like 8% of the world op uh, population. So isn't the problem really, or a trend that we need to address, how to get Europe's act together? Because we are becoming meaningless. And at the end of the day, we might just become a sort of a Disneyland for China or so. Okay, I think uh, Europe getting its act together, that sounds like a perfect question for the former Europe editor of the Financial Times, uh, <laughs> Neil Buckley. Former Eastern, exactly, former yeah. Eastern Europe Well, editor. you know, that's still part uh, of Europe. I mean, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, I take your point, but I think it's, it's slightly misleading just to look at population. You do have to look at the size of the economy as well, and there's no doubt the, e, the EU economy... Uh, and the single market is uh, one of the great uh, economies of the, of the world. It is going to uh, decline in relative weight in coming years, but uh, I think it's, it's a bit early to write it off. Um, but, but yes, clearly the Europe needs to get its act together better. It needs to become uh, more innovative. Uh, it needs to uh, improve its education. Uh, it needs to confront... Uh, the, po the dangers of the aging uh, population, uh, the costs of that on society. So there's, there's an awful lot that Europe needs to get right. Um, and um, unfortunately, I think there's, there's been a tendency for, you know, Europe has spent a lot of the last few years crisis fighting uh, uh, with the Eurozone crisis and then dealing with the Brexit issue. Let's hope that gets resolved soon and Europe can uh, get on and, and look at the more important uh, issues. Sergey, you had a quick add-on? Yeah, a quick add-on. I fully agree with Neil. 
Uh, and also, it's not just EU, but EU Customs Union, which is even bigger, EU Free Trade Area, which is even bigger, and we don't know what happens to the UK after Brexit, but it will be integrated with European economy anyway. But what I would like to say is the very fact that we are discussing the migration challenges in Europe today shows how important Europe is to the world. People want to come to Europe because this is where the opportunity is for people around the world to to achieve something they are aspiring to. And in that sense, this is a uh, model for many, many people in many, many countries in the world. We talked about Western Balkans today, uh, but it's not just Western Balkans. There are many, many countries around the world that see Europe as a model which can be reproduced somewhere else with all its deficiencies and problems. Excellent questions. Thank you to the audience um, for, for really uh, asking these uh, ladies and gentlemen up here some, some great questions to, to get the to get the, the minds going um, and to answer some questions that were really kind of on your minds. Um, so to wrap it up, let's turn it back to our panelists. So Alexia, Sergey, Tim, Neil, how do you future-proof? What, what challenge is the most pressing for you? Is it the same that you started with? And what is your takeaway and conclusion? Alexia, I'll start with you. So I don't know if I believe in future-proofing. I think, I think that's misleading. I think we need to be aware and alert and open-minded to understand how the world around us is changing at a pace that is faster and faster. We need to be able to think across disciplines and not just stay in our silos because the collision and interaction will be important. We need to challenge our assumptions on an almost daily basis and we need to rethink uh, what planning for the future means, which means not sitting there and drawing a beautiful plan but sort of being really iterative about the way we think about the future and agile, so it links to Sergey's points about lifelong learning, we have to also, when we think about the future, know that we can think ahead, be alert, see what's happening, and we're going to have to adjust and readjust and adjust again if we're going to be relevant. I have to make a quick EBRD plug. EBRD saw the writing on the wall when you talked about businesses changing. We are about countries transitioning to market economies but not any old kind of market economy. Green, inclusive, well-governed, resilient. I mean, there's three more, but. <laughs> Neil. Yeah, I don't think uh, the discussion has changed my mind in terms of what the most pressing issues are. I think, and I don't, I'm not sure you can future-proof, uh, as, uh, as you said. I think it's about being uh, aware of the challenges um, and working together to confront them. I think what's, what's important is that, is that in a situation where the old structures are breaking down and there are backlashes, it, it, we need to create coalitions of the willing. You're kind of seeing that in climate change where uh, we have a very uh, prominent US politician who is a, a denier of climate change, but nonetheless there are, there are other politicians, there are state-level politicians, city mayors in the US who are nonetheless getting together uh, and working to resolve this issue. Uh, and you're seeing uh, other countries coalescing uh, despite the lack of US leadership uh, in confronting this. So, uh, so I think that kind of that model of coalitions of the willing is, is one way to move forward. Uh, well, coming back to, to, to this region, since that's why I'm here to talk about this region, uh, it's clear to me that in the last year or so, regional cooperation has taken uh, a hit. Individually, all, all the countries of this region are too small to make any difference by themselves. But together, actually, working together, their politicians, their leaders can do good for uh, their people. But they need to do it uh, on, on one level uh, together. And B, uh, people need to, where they can, hold their politicians to uh, account. And uh, we need uh, less authoritarian trends, uh, uh, more action against corruption, and, 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 and more than just uh, a slogan. And simply just building countries that people want to live in. It's not rocket science. It can be done. Last but not least. Thank you. I think uh, what I've learned is how uh, strong consensus about climate change is, and uh, I never doubted it, but everybody mentioned climate change, and this is the number one problem. I think on your list, we didn't talk about resource scarcity, and that's also a very important implication. I'm, I'm sure that resource scarcity will be handled. Uh, markets know how to leverage new technology and take care of issues like this, and in that sense, I'm optimistic on this particular one, but I would like to come back to this issue that Megatrends are here, they're fast, 
and so we need to adapt, and that means uh, skills are very important. And uh, we need to learn how to learn, we need to learn how to cooperate together, we need to learn how to process and analyze new information, and then we need to learn new skills now and then, all the time, reskill, upskill, all the time. And I think, I think, unfortunately or fortunately, this is going to be the focus of uh, uh, handling those challenges. Kerry, what about you? You spent some time looking at mega trends. Where do you come out after the uh, what we've heard over the last few minutes? I mean, it's impossible to conclude a session on mega trends. Um, you know, but I like this quote from Deloitte. They said, "This century is best described as an era of uncertainty." So. Basically, you can't tackle this by being inside the box. You can't tackle it from looking from outside the box. You have to tackle it as if there is no box. So it means engaging, and to Alexi's point, we need to be honest with ourselves, honest with where we are, where the gaps are, and look, you know, not just for the risks and where we need to hedge, but also the opportunities. Um, you know, Sergey's an optimist, and I'm a fellow optimist, so I think, you know, and Alexia, I, I'm sure all of us up here are, are optimists. So. I'm look a realist. Those, <laughs> <laughs> so look for those, those opportunities. I think that's important. At least it'll lighten the mood. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I, I mean, I think it's you know, I think it's right. You know, what we've heard up here that you can't future proof. As a realist, I worry that we're not quite as fleet as foot as we need to be. Uh, governments are not as fleet of foot as they need to be, and everyone, individuals, all of us, we're going to have to become a lot more flexible, a lot more fleet of foot if we're to deal with these mega trends. I mean, that will be, you know, my my worry as we worry about this pocket dilemma and how do we get to that position. But um, big thank you to our live audience here in Sarajevo. Big thank you to our panel as well. Thank you for listening to Pocket Dilemmas. It is the podcast which explores the political and economic problems shaping our world. You can review us on iTunes. Email us at dilemmas at ebrd.com. Follow us on Twitter. We'd love that. At EBRD is where you'll find us. Thank you. Goodbye. This podcast was brought to you by the EBRD. We'll be back soon with a new episode. In the meantime, send us your feedback, suggestions, and ideas on dilemmas at ebrd.com. And remember, reviewing and rating us helps others to find us. Until next time.